Good morning. I'm the Reverend Dave Clements, and I serve this congregation as the interim minister of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. We extend a welcome today to our members and friends, and to those of you who might be joining us online for the first time. If you'd like to know more about our church, we invite you to go to our website and click on for more information, and an email will be sent to you. We also honor the ground that our building sits on of our ancient ancestors and pay tribute to them this day. And now, Linda, what's happening this coming week in our church? Good morning, I'm the Reverend Linda White. And I'm going to let you know about some of the activities that are happening in this church this week. There are many ways for you to connect during the week. On Wednesday evening at 7, we will be holding a memorial service for those we have lost this past year. At 7 p.m. on Thursday for Adult RE, there will be discussion around a TED Talk. And then Friday morning at 9.30, please join us for muffin and coffee chat with the ministers. We also invite you to register for General Assembly this year. Instructions on how to do that are in the Builder. General Assembly will be 100% virtual. Cost is $150 total. General Assembly starts on Wednesday evening, but there is an event on Tuesday just prior to General Assembly um, a group that I'm very fond of, have special feelings for because I'm the president. Uh, we will be talking about transforming and ending colonization. Instructions for how to register are in the builder or you can contact me and I can give you more information. Please plan to attend coffee hour today at 11.30 after the service. And next Sunday, we'll not be producing a service and having a sermon as we have in the last couple of months, but we invite you to join online and watch the broadcast on Sunday, which will start at 9 a.m. That broadcast will be of the Sunday worship service for General Assembly. And now we have special opening words from Jerry Davis. Good morning and happy Father's Day to our dads and to any special men in our lives. My name is Jerry Davis and I am Reverend Dave Clemens' partner and I'm speaking this morning from Westlake, Ohio. I am in the Center for Artful Living, where I am the Artistic Director for the Farrell Foundation. We provide services and enrichment opportunities to individuals and families who are impacted by dementia and Alzheimer's. And, and we are sitting in our music studio. I was asked this morning to share the opening reading and in honor of Father's Day, I have a book on Barack Obama, Dreams for My Father, and a companion book, The Audacity of Hope. And this morning's reading is taken from that book in which Barack speaks of remembering his dad and the story of race and inheritance. You need to check out this book at some time if you have not. The quote by Barack Obama. Of course, in the end, a sense of mutual understanding isn't enough. After all, talk is cheap. Like any value, empathy must be acted upon. When I was a community organizer back in the 80s, I would often challenge neighborhood leaders by asking them where they put their time, energy, and money. 
Those are the true tests of what we value. I tell them, regardless of what we like to tell ourselves, if we aren't willing to pay a price for our values, if we aren't willing to make some sacrifices in order to realize them, then we should ask ourselves whether we truly believe in them at all. By these standards, at least, it sometimes appears that Americans today value nothing so much as being rich, thin, young, famous, safe, and entertained. We say we value the legacy we leave, the next generation, and then saddle that generation with mountains of debt. We say we believe in equal opportunity, but then stand idle while millions of American children languish in poverty. We insist that we value family, but then structure our economy and organize our lives as to ensure that our families get less and less of our time. And yet, as a part of us knows better, we hang on to our values, even if it's, they seem at times tarnished and worn, even if as a nation in our own lives, we have betrayed them more often than we care to remember. What else is there to guide us? Those values are our inheritance. What makes us who we are as people? And although we recognize that they are subject to challenge, they can be poked and prodded and debunked and turned inside out by intellectuals and cultural critics. And they're proven to be both surprisingly durable and surprisingly constant across classes and races and faiths and generations. We can make claims on their behalf so long as we understand that our values must be tested against fact and experience, so long as we recall that they demand our deeds and not just words. Again, the words of President Barack Obama from the book, The Audacity of Hope, Thoughts on Reclaiming the American Dream. So I wanna take this opportunity to Think about all the challenges we face in our lives today, those challenges of urban unrest, the challenges with the COVID-19 virus in our families, in our communities, and typical challenges that each of us face day in and day out. And I, on behalf of Dave and I, are wishing you and your families the very best. I appreciate the kindness and the warmth that you have extended on my visits to Peoria and wish all of you the best in the days ahead.
dedicated to all the members of the Peoria UU Church. Well, thank you, UU Search Committee. Your work is finally finished. Let's all give a warm UU welcome to the Reverend Jennifer Innes. Didn't know how I was going to rhyme that, did you? Thank you, Reverend Clements and Assistant Reverend White. Your leadership during this transition has been out of sight. Peoria UU Church, the chalice is our life. Peoria UU Church, our future looks mighty bright. One more time. Peoria UU Church, the chalice is our life. Peoria UU Church, our future looks mighty bright. Our future looks mighty bright. Our future looks mighty bright. Good morning, everyone. Today, I want to claim some time in our service to celebrate Father's Day and all of the father figures in our lives that help us to grow up healthy, brave, and smart. This morning's story is simply entitled, I Love You, Daddy, by Jillian Harker. You're getting tall, little bear, said Daddy Bear, big enough to come climbing with me. Little bear's eyes opened wide in surprise. Do you really mean that? Daddy Bear nodded. He led Little Bear to a giant tree. Little Bear tried to scramble up onto the lowest branch. He tumbled backwards. Daddy Bear nudged Little Bear. Daddy Bear tugged Little Bear. You can do it, he whispered. And suddenly, Little Bear found that he could. I love you, Daddy thought Little Bear. You're getting brave, Little Bear, said Daddy Bear, daring enough to gather honey with me. Little Bear gasped. Could I really? Daddy Bear winked. He led Little Bear to another tree and pointed to a hole in the trunk. Little Bear reached out his paw. A furious buzzing filled his ears. Little Bear pulled his paw back. Just be quick, Daddy Bear said. You have thick fur. The bees can't hurt you. You can do it, he smiled. And suddenly, Little Bear found that he could. I love Daddy, thought Little Bear. You're getting smart, Little Bear. Smart enough to find a good winter den. Little Bear grinned. Do you really think so? I know so, said Daddy Bear. Little Bear set off. Not too far from food, said Daddy Bear. Ready for when spring comes. Little Bear sniffed the wind. Look for high ground, said Daddy Bear, to keep us dry. Little Bear padded up over the rocks. Somewhere safe and warm, said Daddy Bear, away from danger. Here, called Little Bear as he disappeared into a deep cave. Daddy Bear followed. He looked all around. Perfect, he said. I love Daddy, thought Little Bear. Did I climb well? Little Bear asked on his way home. You did, replied Daddy Bear. Was I brave? Asked Little Bear. You were, answered Daddy Bear. Did I find a good den? Asked Little Bear. The very best, smiled Daddy Bear. I'm proud of you, Little Bear. Soon, Little Bear and Daddy Bear reached home. And suddenly, Little Bear felt very tired, but there was something he wanted to say. I love you, began Little Bear. 
but he didn't finish. Daddy Bear stroked Little Bear's head. I love you too, he said. May we all share our love for each other every day. And today, shower the nurturing men in our lives with a little extra care and a few more hugs. Happy Father's Day. And now for a special surprise. We have a new banner. It was created by Pat Denzer, who is a very talented quilter, also a new member of the board. And so this is the banner that we will see hanging and that we, we would see in the March if we were actually at General Assembly. Isn't it beautiful? If you could see it, you would see all the intricate quilting and how wonderfully she has captured our beautiful window. Universalist Unitarian Church, UU Church, established in 1843 in Peoria, Illinois. Thank you, Pat. Who else? So many others. If I've missed someone, please forgive me, but thank you to all of those who have helped make this possible. And now we light candles of love and support today for Chris Cole, who is currently hospitalized. He's out of danger from the coronavirus, but he's having other difficulties. We wish him well. We send our Hearts, our love to Barbara Ryan, who is grieving the loss of her husband, Bob. And we extend our joy, respect, and our promises for help for the new UUCP, that's us, board leadership. The new president is Linda Fairbanks, and the vice president is Joyce Rosenberg. We also send healing wishes to Ron Love. He is out of the hospital and he is recovering from an illness. We send our congratulations to Lisa Nelson Raby, Bradley University's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences awarded her the Stein Academy of American Poets Prize. Congratulations, Lisa. We send thanks to the board and its members for all of the work that they did this past year. We send congratulations to our new board members, Nora Sullivan, Pat Denzer, and John Lothrop. Our spoken meditation today, Prayer for our Weary Times, is by Margaret Weiss. Holy One, our hearts are weary, are tired, and are breaking. Our hearts are stretching as they are pulled and pushed, bruised and battered by all the suffering and brokenness and pain. Our ears are ringing, ringing with harsh words, with yelling, with gunfire that echoes in our streets and takes lies, lives of innocence without cause. They're ringing with the affirmation that black lives matter again and again until this idea is manifested in our legislation, our communities, and our hearts. We have heard stories of equality and justice, but our eyes burn from the instances of inequality, racism, and in justice that illustrate we are still far from where we hope to be. Our mouths speak words of hope, of courage, and of truth. And at times we find that words do no justice. The brokenness feels too big. Our bodies, 
our collective bodies built for lifting one another up and built for holding each other in love. They're being used against one another as weapons and the ammunition is hatred and fear. Spirit of life and love in this time of dissonance, in this holy time of urgency to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, help us to find our voice. Help us to see beyond this brokenness to a time of healing and true community. Help us to remember that the only journey toward healing is one that is paved through humility, acceptance of responsibility, and counteracting complacency. Ours is not a solitary journey, but one taken together, bolstered by deep listening and deeply rooted love. May we find the strength needed for the journey here, in this place, and in all places where people gather for love, for humanity, and for justice. Today's offering words are by Kristen Collins. We give to remind ourselves how many gifts we have to offer. We give to remember that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. We give because we believe in music and sacred place and space. We give with the faith that together we have enough. And how can you make an offering today? This can be done by sending in a check, going to our website and making a financial donation, or texting or calling 833-484-0328. Wait for the prompt and follow the instructions. We thank you for your donations. We are depending upon them to continue the work that we do as a church. Continuing with the tradition that Linda and I started a few weeks ago, uh, we will now have a history moment entitled, The Night We Met to Move, and Kathy Carter will share that with us. In the summer of 2001, our congregation was offered an opportunity. Our church building at that time was downtown on Hamilton Boulevard, and our neighbor, Methodist Medical Center, really wanted to buy our property. This was a major turning point in our history. Our future path would depend on our congregation's decision to stay or to move somewhere else. Over the next two years, we went through a thoughtful process to make that decision. What I learned from that experience was that no matter what decision we made, we would gain something and we would lose something. If we stayed where we were, we could work to preserve our historic building with its unique architectural features, but we'd lose a unique opportunity for a fresh start. If we moved to a new location, we'd gain more and better space for a growing congregation, especially for our children and youth, but we would lose the beloved building that was our home because it would be torn down. Well, as you know, our congregation ultimately chose the second option and we relocated to our new home on Richwoods Boulevard. I remember going to the final service in the old building. It was called The Last Goodbye. The pews had already been removed, so we sat in rows of chairs in the sanctuary. The lights were dim and the evening sun was slanting through the windows. People lit candles and shared their memories of that church home. Near the end of the service, we sang Spirit of Life. I almost couldn't sing it because I was holding back tears. 
But even though I was sad, I was also joyful about the new possibilities that would open up for us in our new church building. Now our congregation is in another time of transition. In the past couple of years, we've been through losses and changes. Many of us feel sad about the people we miss or will be leaving us soon and the traditions that have been changed or postponed. And it's okay to feel sad, but we can also look forward to what we'll gain in the next chapter of our history. Our new minister, Reverend Jennifer, will join us soon, and together we'll figure out the future we hope for and how we can create it. Because especially now, we know that our church is not a building. We are the church. We'll get through the hard times, we'll enjoy the good times, we'll take care of each other, we'll do good work in our community and world, and we'll keep our church going strong as we move into the future. One door closes, another opens. That is the nature of life. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Many of you recognize these words from Ecclesiastes verse 3, one to chapter 3, 1 through 8. This particular writing is from the New International Version of the Bible. Well, if you don't know the words, I'm sure that they at least invoked some of the sentiments. These words are not gentle, but they are prophetic, as now we are in a time to tear down and a time to build, even a time for refraining from embracing. This is a time for those of us who genuinely care about others to become active allies, not just to witness, not to be so upset that we feel we have done our part because we got upset and went to tears. About feelings, please stop waiting to have events so heinous that they move you to tears or heartache. We all know what's happening to the mar marginalized peoples in this country. Why does it take murder to make us take note? Don't be out of sight, out of mind people. Others are suffering even when you don't want to acknowledge it. Are you wondering why I'm saying these things when these are my final words to this congregation? Shouldn't I be talking about how wonderful my experience has been and how I'm going to miss everybody? Well, more about that in a minute. I've been a member here for 25 years and your minister for three. Yes, your minister. Though there are some who still cannot honor that. I was your two-term board president when we were on the journey that led to our current place of worship. I could tell you stories about that time that you would not want to believe, and controversies of the past year that actually make it easier to leave. 
I know there are lists of things that I've done, said, mishandled, that you may want to bring forward as a defense right now. After all, she's not perfect. No, I'm not. And neither is this beloved church. You may be upset right now saying, I'm not a racist. I'm not misogynist. I'm not anti-gay. You don't like the words white supremacy, white privilege, white fragility. I know some of you are cringing. Why am I saying these things in this public forum? Well, it is because I want the best for this congregation filled with people I have come to love and care about. I've been in this congregation and at this church for many of its most important events and mine also. The plan to move, taking the first shovel full of dirt to build the foundation here. This church has been kind to me. My ordination here was beautiful. My oldest grandchild was dedicated here and my son's memorial service was held here. This is a place that is special to me and that I hold in my heart. But I don't believe this church can go forward with integrity without acknowledging its growing edges and recognizing how these things might flare up in congregational and community involvement as you wrestle with how to be on the right side of history and actually doing the work of justice. If we have been silent, we know that this is the time to speak resoundingly. This is the time to share our greatest love, to fight the tyranny of hate. When the rallies end and the newscasters have moved on to more titillating subjects, I pray that this church will be infiltrating and interrupting those institutions and systems that have had their knees on the necks of black, brown, red, yellow, and poor people. I've stayed for 25 years because of the theology and the friends I've made here. But it's time for me to go to be with my daughter-in-law and grandchildren, to do more social justice work with my black and indigenous family, friend, peoples, to see what else life has to offer. I offer you peace, love, and grace, peace, love, and grace to you all. May it be so. Moving on, we pick the theme for today's service, mine and Linda's last. This only seemed logical because within our life experiences, each of us face many times where we find ourselves moving on, what is the best choice. And sometimes that can be painful and requires us to really reimagine what will be. And other times we come to a fork in the road and it's time to take it, regardless of the time or the reason. So each of us face these moments in our life. How do we end? And how do we begin again? When I am thinking of moving on, I'm reminded of the choice one makes when you're faced with the move. You know, what do I bring with me? What do I leave behind? And what do I take with me when I leave? When I look back at the last 18 months, 
As far as what I brought, I came here from South Africa. I still remember the first day I arrived in Peoria and it was minus two, and I had left South Africa with the equivalent of a temperature of 90 degrees in their summer. And I was really hoping that I could bring warm weather with me. But I was on my way to Peoria and I was excited about the new opportunity, another congregation, a congregation that had had a minister, Michael Brown, for 28 years. And I knew there would be challenges. And I knew there would be opportunities. And as I arrived and wondered, what I brought with me was the desire to, and the training of an interim minister, and the opportunity to welcome and help a congregation to prepare for a settled minister. When I look back at the time, it seems like it has went like this. And I remember last summer a sermon that I gave called The Elephants in the Room. And I had been here over six months and I had identified elephants in the room. And if you're familiar with that terminology, it's those things that we don't wish to talk about. It's taken from the story, an African uh, folktale where a gentleman goes into a wonderful historical museum and he sees and looks around and when he comes back out, the curator asks him, what did you think of that, all your things? And he tells him, he, going through the list of the things that he saw, and then he said, well, what about the elephant? And he said, what elephant? And from that, the elephant in the room fable began as an illustration of the things that are there that we choose not to talk about. And so as I stand here and think about those elephants in the room that I identified, the one being conflict avoidant, the one being improving communication between each other, and the third one being lack of vision and desire of what you want it to be. And as we look back, we've tackled together each of those. And there's been painful moments in disagreements, but there's been tremendous growth by you in this congregation as you supported and followed your ministers. When I think back about conflict avoidant, we had conflicts, but we faced them. And as I encourage you as you move on and as I leave and take with me this experience. I ask you to continue on in the path that you are in. You know, one of the roles of an interim minister is to help a congregation to understand the difference between change and transition. When I came here, I remember that first sermon and I talked about the fact that I knew I would hear things like, we've always done it this way. Why do we need to look at things differently? And as I held up a mirror in front of you and asked you to look and to try in ways in which better ways of thinking and being and doing. And many of you have responded. And one of those things is to prepare you for a settled minister. And we had this thing called a pandemic that kind of threw Linda and I in our last few months of how to do ministry and how to reinvent church and how to do services. But one of the things that I am most proud of is that as a congregation, you found a way to adapt 
You found a way to embrace change. And I was so proud of all of you and those who made it happen that you called a settled minister without meeting this person face to face. You need to congratulate yourself of this accomplishment. This tells me that you can change, you can transform, you can begin to become all that you can be and more. When I think of the things that I take with me, I take with me the many cherished experiences that I've shared with you, the one-on-ones that I've had with many of you as we talked about challenges and problems in your life, and as I've watched you grow and embrace and begin to solve the issues that you were dealt with. And as a congregation, as you become engaged in a process, in a way to reinvent yourself, I'm most excited that with what is happening in our country and in our nation, that you are rising up. You are recognizing that it's time for the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria to take a stand, to be heard in this community. Many of you have done the work as individuals, and now you're finding ways in which you can do it as a UU community. And I admonish you to continue in that work, continue in the important work of racial justice, continue to look at your own biases and your own white supremacy as you continue to do the hard work that our people of color have asked us to do for so many years. In a move, we take things with us. I take with me the privilege of having been called to serve you in the growth that you have given to me. I have been changed because I have known all of you. And so how do we move on and how do we end? We do so with joy and with anticipation. And may as you prepare to have a settled minister here, may you continue in the work that you have started with Reverend Linda and myself. You know, what many of you have asked what is in store for me, and as I started the search process and was somewhat into it, I realized that I needed to spend some time at home with my partner. He has been a trooper as he's supported me through the interns, as he supported me through South Africa, as he supported me here. And so together we're going to have a wonderful summer, the first summer we've had in over three and a half years. And in the fall, I will reserve my search for another interim opportunity. There's a song from the musical Wicked that I think sums up some of the feelings and thoughts that I have about each of you. I've heard it said that people come into our lives for a reason, bringing something we must learn. And we are led to those who help us most to grow if we let them. And we help them in return. Well, I don't know if I believe that's true, but I know I am who I am today because I have known each of you. Like a comet pulled from orbit as it passes a sun, like a stream that meets a boulder halfway through the wood. Who can say if I've been changed for the better but because I have known each of you, I have been changed for good. It 
well may be that we will never meet again in this lifetime. So let me say before we part, so much of me is made of what I've learned from you. You'll be with me like a handprint on my heart. And now, whatever way our stories end, I know you have rewritten mine by being together. Like a ship blown from its morning, like a wind off the sea, like a sea dropped by a skybird in a distant wood. Who can say if I've been changed for the better? But because I've known each of you, because I have known each of you, I have been changed for good. And just to clear the air, I ask forgiveness for the things I've done you blame me for, but then I guess we know there's blame to share. And none of that seems to matter anymore. Like a comet pulled from orbit and it passes the sun, like a stream that meets a boulder halfway through the wood, like a ship blown from its morning by a wind off the sea, like a sea dropped by a bird in the wood. Who can say if I have been changed for the better? I do believe I have been changed for the better. And because I have known each of you, because I have known each of you, I have been changed for good. Blessed be, go in peace. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle around to tend these bags. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time.
our closing words for this final service of being together. The Church Has Left the Building by Margaret Weiss. The Church is not a place, it is a people. The Church is not only a steeple above the tree line, streets and cars, rather it is a people proclaiming to the world that we are here for the work of healing and of justice. The church is not walls built stone upon stone, held together by mortar, but rather person linked with person linked with person. All ages and genders and abilities, a community built on the foundation of reason, faith, and love. The church is not just a set of doors open on Sunday morning, but the commitment day after day and moment after moment of our hearts creaking upon the doors of welcome to the possibility of new experience and radical welcome. The church is not simply a building, a steeple, a pew. The church is a gathering together of all people and experiences and fear and love and hope in our resilient hearts, gathering however we can to say to the world, welcome, come in, lay down your heartache, and pick up your hope and love. For the church is us, each and every one of us, together a beacon of hope to this world that it so sorely needs. Amen, and may it be so. May it be so. In our faith, um, ministers come and go, and there is a ritual for ministers leaving. And so today, we offer this ritual. It is now time for us to formally let go of one another. In our free churches, there is perhaps no bond more sacred than the bond between ministers and the congregation that has chosen to serve them. This is because a minister's power and authority come not from an on high, but from the hearts and minds of those they serve. It's only right and fitting that we have a ceremony to recognize its ending. You have offered us your free spirit. In gratitude for this gift, we offer sage to symbolize the wisdom that comes from creating meaningful worship together rooted in a spiritual life. We hereby return the ministry of worship to your able hands. Use it to speak the truth in love to one another May this loving truth be a source of joy and gladness for you. We thank you for your service in our pulpit. We accept its power of freedom for ourselves and release you from your service as worship leaders. You have welcomed us into the transitional moments of your lives, times of sorrow and of joy. In gratitude for this gift you have given us, we offer the herb rosemary for remembrance of comfort given and joys celebrated together. We hereby return the ministry of pastoral care to your hands. Use it to comfort, to celebrate the milestones of your lives with compassion and care. We thank you for the pastoral care you have offered us. We accept its power of compassion for ourselves and release you from your service as pastoral caregivers. You have asked us to serve as administrators of this professional religious leaders. In gratitude for this gift you have given us, we offer time as symbol of our time together and of experience. We hereby return the administry of this congregation to you. May you guide yourselves with courage and wisdom into a strong and sure future. 
We thank you for your professional leadership. We accept its power of vision and knowledge and release you from your service as professional leaders. For the past weeks that we have been together, we have lit a candle to symbolize our ministry together, which is our chalice. And that candle is still burning, but it symbolizes also the fact that our ministries have run out and that our respective ministries will continue separately. Reverend Lynn and I will now light two candles from the chalice one that will symbolize your ministry and the one that symbolizes how our ministries will continue separately. We release, we release you from our covenant with one another. Go your way in peace, truth, and love. We release you from our covenant with one another. Go your way in peace, truth, and love. 